We're going to continue this morning with some more style analysis, comparing Matthew Franklin Whittier's work to Charles Dickens, supposedly Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol. This is going to be a little bit informal. I've got some materials prepared, but uh, my thoughts are a little bit loose on how I'm going to proceed. So forgive the informality. Uh, what I think I'll start with is to read the opening of A Christmas Carol, the way it was published, and the way that I think Matthew wrote it. And the way I derive that is to look at Dickens' handwritten draft and undo the changes that he made the, <clears throat> the best that I can. And this may not be the original because the handwritten draft that I have access to from the Morgan Library is probably you know, not the first draft. But still, it would reflect more of Matthew and Abby's original writing in the redacted portions um, than the final does. So I'm going to read it as Dickens published it. Here's my 1844 edition. And uh, what I'm going to do is just read the first opening, few opening paragraphs, and then I'll do the same with some of Matthew's work and just to compare style. So he starts out with stave one, Marley's ghost. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Mind, I don't mean to say that I know of my own knowledge what there is particularly dead about a doornail. I might have been inclined, myself, to regard a coffin nail as the deadest piece of ironmongery in the trade, but the wisdom of our ancestors is in the simile, and my unhallowed hands shall not disturb it or the country's done for. You will therefore permit me to repeat emphatically that Marley was as dead as a doornail. That's the way it was published. Now, as best I can make out, this is how it was originally written by Matthew, or closer to the way it was written by Matthew. Old Marley's Ghost. Marley was dead, to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and his mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Alas, I don't mean to say that I know myself what there is particularly dead about a doornail. I should have been inclined myself to consider a coffin nail as the deadest piece of ironmongery in the trade. But the wisdom of our ancestors is in the simile, and my unhallowed hands shall not disturb it or the country's done for. You will therefore permit me to repeat that Marley was as dead as a doornail. Um, in particular, Dickens has added where Matthew originally had said, alas, I don't mean to say that I know myself what there is particularly dead about a doornail. Dickens has said, mind, I don't mean to say that I know myself of my own knowledge what there is particularly dead about a doornail. So this is typical of Dickens' changes in his handwritten draft. He stretched out Matthew's crisper writing style. Okay, because, you know, we have, alas, I don't mean to say that I know myself what there is particularly dead about a doornail, and Dickens adds, mind, I don't mean to say that I know myself of my own knowledge what there is particularly dead about a doornail. So Matthew was a better writer. <laughs> we, now we're going to see that he was also an earlier writer. Now we're going to go back. Um, we're going to go back to 1830 and 31, but before we do that, we're going to go back to 1833. This is a rather poor copy of a book entitled The Life and Adventures of Dr. Dodemus Duckworth. And uh, let's see, I want to find the title page for you. These pages are very fragile. Um, there we go. I'll hold it up long enough that you can freeze the frame and read if you want to. I think it's in focus. This is attributed mistakenly to Asa Green. Now, Asa Green was uh, an editor of a newspaper in Pittsfield, Massachusetts called the Berkshire American. 
that Matthew contributed to when he was a boy of like 13 or so. And then when Asa Green moved to New York City and established a bookstore, bookstore and a newspaper, the New York Constellation, Matthew moved up there in late 1829 and started contributing to it while he was also pursuing a mercantile career up there. And before too long in 1830, he became the editor. Now I know that by style and by the many different clues that Matthew became the editor, basically ran the paper, apparently, while Asa Green ran his bookstore. That's what I take from it. And then when that newspaper folded in 1832, probably due to a cholera epidemic, Matthew wrote five books during the period of 33 and 34. All of them have been mistakenly attributed to Asa Green. They're all Matthews. I can prove it beyond any reasonable doubt. And this is one of them published in 1833. Asa Green's name is on it as the man who registered it, but not as the author. Asa Green is not on any of these as the author, but Matthew always published anonymously. Now, so this book is a satire on quack medicine. It, it so happens that Asa Green was a medical doctor uh, but Matthew and he apparently were very much simpatico on the, on the issue of quacks. So now you know that in A Christmas Carol, there's this emphasis that this is real. This was Matthew's trademark. He would do these fall biographies, and he would make them seem as though they were real biographies. See, that was typical of him. Now, in this book, this is a supposed biography of this quack doctor, and it starts out with an epistle prefatory. It says, to John Con D.D. of Toppingtown, Reverend Sir. It's a testimonial. This is the author is writing to the Reverend John Con D.D. of Toppingtown, to whom he is sending a copy of the book, a complimentary copy of the book. That's what's going on. And uh, it's written as though John Kahn was a close friend of the subject of the biography, Dr. Dodamus Duckworth. And it's all straight. It's all done uh, completely deadpan, you know. So I'll read a little bit of that. But this is basically parallel to A Christmas Carol where he, where he says this is real and Marley really died and so on, okay? So he says, Reverend Sir, I herewith transmit you a copy of The Life and Adventures of Dr. Duckworth, which I beg you will accept as a small testimony of my esteem. And I do this the rather because, though an octogenarian and a clergyman, you are neither too old nor too grave to laugh at the follies and mistakes of mankind in whatever station or condition of life they may be found. I have a still further motive. You are among the very few remaining persons who were thoroughly acquainted with the subject of these memoirs. You knew him from his early childhood. You were conversant with his peculiarities, both of mind and manners. You had occasion to see much of him, etc., etc. You might have noticed I've got some pages laid in here. That's because this book was missing like two or three pages, and I just went ahead and printed them out and put them in there. Um, let's go to the beginning of the story itself. This kind of proof, this is why I say this is not the strongest evidence that I have. This kind of proof is always conjecture and opinion to a certain extent, unless you have 2,300 of Matthew's works like I do, you know, and uh, I can't read all 2,300 of Matthew's works to you, you know, but I, I have read them. Okay, so this is chapter one, and it goes a, a little summary. This was a, a convention of the time to put a little summary of the points that are coming up. I won't read that. Now he starts. It is not unfrequently observed by authors in commencing an account of the lives of, lives of distinguished men that little is known of their birth, parentage, or early years, and the little which is recorded depends so much on tradition and vague report that the public are as likely to obtain the early life of any other person as of the proposed subject of the biography. There seem to be certain qualities and characteristics attached, as it were, by, right, by prescriptive right to each subject, which must not under any circumstances be wanting, 
Thus, if he be a warrior, he must in his childhood, if not in his very infancy, have achieved a great many remarkable exploits, must have attacked and vanquished boys of twice his age, must have protected the weaker and overthrown the stronger of his playmates, must have regarded a bloody nose no more than he would have done a straw, and finally must have performed in his single person all the daring and heroic actions of a puerile nature which have taken place within the memory of man, and do not happen to be already appropriated by some more fortunate individual. Is he a wit? Then many notable instances of, an in, of his infantile smartness and early genius are recollected and recorded, a great part of which he never heard of, and which many of them have been struck from a skull much thicker than his own, and so forth and so on. That gives you an idea of the way Matthew would get into a story. Now, what I'm going to do, remember, that's 1833. So Dickens was writing a dinner at Poplar Rock, Walk in 33. Now we're going to go to 1830, 31 and 32, when Matthew was writing for and editing for the New York Constellation. This is before Dickens had published any fiction that I personally am aware of. Um, so the, we start with 1831 and then move into 32 here. Uh, actually, these aren't in order the way they're showing up in my Kindle. So I'll just read them the way they show up here. And uh, keep in mind that not only was Dickens not publishing fiction at this time, and that these are definitely Matthews, but that um, I'm going to take the Kindle out of its child wrap there. Um, but that Dickens could have had access to these. Now, I looked into this. Could the New York Constellation have been available to Charles Dickens in 1831? And what I found was that the British Library has a full run of this newspaper in its archives. That's all they could tell me. They don't know when it got there. Excuse me, who donated it? You know, whether it was there at the time or, you know, was in a private collection at the time, they don't know. But what I do know is that an 1830s, early 1830s American newspaper is probably unlikely to have been donated later on because anybody that owned the full run of this newspaper in America is unlikely to go to London to donate it. You know, they'll donate it to the American Antiquarian Society or the Houghton Library at Harvard or the Morgan Library or somebody like that. They won't go overseas to donate it to England. There's no reason to do that. Therefore, logically, this would have been something donated by someone who lived in England, which means that it was sent over at the time, probably in 1830, 31, 32, collected by somebody at that time, and then however much later, donated to the British Library by a Britisher. See, that's just, you know, detective work, detective logic. So I've got quite a few of these. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and extraordinary evidence takes time. If you, as a skeptic, are demanding extraordinary evidence, then it behooves you to take the time to listen to it. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not serious. OK, so we'll just put it that way. Um, let's see, this thing shut down on me yet again. If I if I basically look aside for 20 seconds, it shuts down. Probably that's adjustable. This all of these are signed D. And the reason I picked these, there's a great many of them that are unsigned. It probably would have been on target. But Matthew, I have determined, definitely used this signature, the initial D, to write in the constellation. Therefore, all of these would definitely have been uh, Matthew's work. Now, April 30, 1831, it's called Marching Backwards. Matthew made quite a bit of fun of, uh, of military musters, you know, military exercises, because he was, he was a Quaker. At this point, he was still a Quaker. They hadn't disowned him by this time. The captain of a militia company, as everybody knows, I'm going to turn sideways, is in this country an officer of great dignity and importance. In what manner the incumbent frequently discharges the duty of this office may be gathered from the following incident. The captain of whom we now speak 
had but recently been elected when he brought out his company for the first time to parade. His own house being on the green, he of course took the opportunity to exercise his men immediately in front of it in order that his new married wife might see how finely he looked in his regimentals. Every variety of evolutions of which our hero was master was executed on the occasion. The cross and the hollow square and the wedge were all formed. The difficult maneuver of whipping the snake was likewise attempted, and from the folds of its entanglements our commander issued forth with his men at his heels like a conqueror flushed with victory. At length the hour for breaking up arrived, and the whole corps was drawn up in military array directly in front of the captain's mansion, where, after having discharged a grand salute, a splendid collation awaited them. Being a little too near the building for the safety of its windows, their commander gives the word to retreat three steps in the rear. The company commences the backward march, and our captain, as if to encourage his men by his example, performs the same evolution, and so on, except that he <laughs> trips over backwards and goes down the cellar. It was typical of Matthew to launch into any story, including a humorous story, with a serious preamble. I've seen that over and over and over. So we see it there. The same is found in A Christmas Carol. Um, now, let's see. We're going to turn to July 23, 1831. All of this side D. Abijah Stump or the man that was married in spite of his teeth. There is nothing like a good set of teeth. So thought Abijah Stump as he stood viewing the various sets of a dentist's shop in Broadway. Abijah was born and raised in the country. Nature had given him a tolerable set of teeth, but he had taken little or no pains to preserve them. They had seldom experienced those ablutions so necessary to their healthfulness and beauty. And as for undergoing the cleansing operation of the toothbrush, Abijah had never heard the name, much less was he acquainted with the use of that instrument. His grinders, one after another, decayed, and nothing but a few rotten stumps, just sufficient for mastication, remained. In short, Abijah, though hardly turned of thirty, was a toothless man. For a time, Abijah cared but little for the loss he had sustained. To him, it seemed no loss, only so far as it rendered the process of chewing rather more difficult. But as luck or ill would have it, he had lately fallen in love, and the effect on his outer man was soon visible. At church, no country beau was seen more spruce than Abijah. He wore a large ruffle attached to his shirt, which projected full six inches in front, while his queue was tied up in an eel skin and stuck out to double that length behind. His Sunday hat... <coughs> though somewhat rusty by age, was newly brushed up, shoe buckles and knee buckles, for Abijah arrayed himself in small clothes, experienced the same operation, and cowhide boots were exchanged for shoes manufactured of yellow sheepskin. The change in personal appearance of our hero was indeed wonderful, and all the old women remarked, quote, that if Abijah Stump didn't have Sally Perkins, it wouldn't be for want of trying. You get a sense you know, of the, of the style and the mentality behind this. Um, February 11, 1832. Remember, Dickens hadn't published any fiction that I'm aware of at this point. The Yankee and the Grapevines. It seems as if there was no end to the ingenuity of those varmints, yelloped Yankee peddlers, notwithstanding their descriptions of wooden nutmegs and wooden clocks. This could be barns, I couldn't read it and oak leaf cigars have all been exposed, and the public cautioned and recautioned against trading with the vendors of these and such like articles. Still, we hear of numerous instances in which, under a new face, the real Simon Pure is playing off his old tricks and guiling the honest farmers and farmers' wives wherever he comes. The following account, coming to us from unquestionable authority, may be fully relied upon, we are the more particular in stating this, that our readers in the country may be put upon their guard against the imposition which has been, as we shall relate, but too successfully practiced. A few weeks since, one of these itinerant merchants that swarm the land from the Great Eastern have, in Connecticut, made his appearance in a village in the northern part of Pennsylvania, 
with a sleigh load of grapevines, which were carefully packed up in bundles of a dozen slips each. These bundles were warranted to contain each six different kinds of the richest and rarest foreign grapes, the Isabel, the Muscatel, and other approved varieties. The price was $2 the bundle. The terms one-half cash and one-half at the expiration of two years, when if the vines did not produce grapes such as were represented, the purchase was to be void and the money remanded. So again, a little introduction to a, a story. Now we go to March 24, 1832. Jehoshaphat Jones, The Danger of a Little Courtship. New England is the land of schoolmasters. Here is his native element, the place where of all others he is honored, respected, and appreciated. To be a schoolmaster here is to enjoy no mean office. Her greatest men have in their younger days been pedagogues. Her schools are thus nurses of learning in a twofold sense, for the young who are taught and for their instructors who teach. The office of teacher is coveted, not so much for the pecuniary profit it affords, for that is but small, as for the opportunity it offers for studying the operation of the mind, for applying to actual practice the rules and theories which have been learnt from books, and for gathering that knowledge and experiences of human nature so essential to success in life, and which must else be purchased at so dear a price. The system of schools as here developed is admirably adapted to this mental improvement, in many of the villages, I might say in all, three or four months in a year are all that are allotted for that class of schools known as district schools. The instructors in these are mostly young men from the colleges and higher seminaries of learning who obtain a furlough from their studies in the winter months to take upon themselves the responsibilities of teachers. But what has all, <clears throat> but what has all this to do with Jehoshaphat Jones? Why, simply that Jehoshaphat was a student at college, in his second college year, and of course a great man in embryo. Of course, too, he was one winter engaged in the business of schoolkeeping, and it is to his adventures during that period that these remarks are introductory. Jehoshaphat was born and raised in a seaport town in New England. He had consequently great knowledge of ships and other similar craft. He could tell a coaster from a Chewbacca boat, or a man of war from a mackerel man. He had seen the sea serpent twice, and knew precisely how many humps there were on his back. That was popular those days, sightings of the sea serpent. He was moreover well skilled in the navigation of the coast. He had been a voyage, it might be on a voyage, typo, from Cape Ann to Passamaquoddy all along shore, and was versed in the vernacular tongues of Cape Cod and Marblehead. Now this actually is one of two veiled parodies of Albert Pike, who plagiarized Abby in her poetry. So uh, we won't get into that, but uh, just for style. Now, let's see, that was the 22nd. This is the uh, February 12, 1831. We're going back a bit. Again, Dickens wasn't publishing during this period. The Dutchman and his cheese. A Dutchman, it is well known, adheres tenaciously to the manners and customs of his ancestors. He wears the same style of dress his grandfather and great-grandfather wore before him, smokes his pipe in the same way that they did, and travels the same old roads in spite of the modern inventions of canals and turnpikes. This trait of character is exemplified in the following incident, which a friend of ours used to relate of one Hans von Vogerman. So there's our little uh, straight introduction. Among other points which Hans prided himself upon, was that of cutting his cheese in a smooth, even shape, so that none of the precious articles should be crumbled or wasted. The Van Vogermans had all cut their cheese in the same way, and the art had been handed down from sire to son, from the earliest generation. When Hans at length became the father of a family, this delicate operation was always performed by his own hand, though sometimes, by way of instruction, his eldest boy was permitted to supply his place. Just reading the first couple paragraphs of everything. March 12, 1831. Now, this story, the very first humorous story published by Samuel Clemens when he was 16 years old, is very much like this story, only not as good, because Matthew could tell a joke with a punchline, and apparently Samuel Clemens, the future Mark Twain, could not, not at age 16. 
Now, let's see, 18, March of 1831, how old is Matthew? He is 18 years old, so two years older than Clemens was when he published his first. But Matthew started publishing at age 12, okay, in 1825. Better stuff than Mark Twain started out with. Maybe I'll read a little bit of this. <laughs> Maybe I'll read this one. It's very short, and you can go back and, and look up Mark Twain's first humorous story, which appeared in the carpet bag, which Matthew was a financial investor in and a very heavy contributor to. Upsetting of a dandy. There is no creature that takes to himself more airs than a city dandy, none that pretends to more wit and wisdom, and none that betrays a greater want of them. One of this class of bipeds, Matthew loved that term, by the way, who had escaped from the city a few weeks last summer, to inhale the country atmosphere and astonish the natives, betook himself to the stagecoach as the most economical way of traveling. Lest, however, his motives should be suspected, he invariably informed his fellow travelers that he preferred this kind of conveyance for the opportunities it afforded of studying human nature. There's our intro. It so happened that during our exquisite's travels, he was thrown into company with a jack tar, fresh from the forecastle, and bound on a short trip to his native village to recruit and make repairs. Jack was seized upon by our cockney philosopher as a rare subject of investigation, one from which might be extracted the material for many a precious story on his return home. He accordingly commenced his examination by a variety of impertinent questions to, what, to which Jack answered with apparent good humor. Emboldened by his success, our student next proceeds to quiz the honest old tar, and finding his jokes not resented, he plies them with increasing rudeness. At the next stage, Jack was the first to alight, while our young philosopher, who by this time began to suspect that his inquiries into human nature might not result so satisfactorily as he had expected, was the last to leave the coach. No sooner had he alighted than Jack made towards him, the dandy retreats. Jack follows him up and seizing him by the collar exclaimed, Now we'll square accounts, you landlubber. Oh, oh, let go my coat. You'll ruin me, cried the dandy. What do you want to do with me? Just to pay you for that soft soap you have been giving me, you rascal, says Jack, giving him a lee lurch by which the terrified dandy was thrown flat on his back into a mud puddle. Jack was proceeding to further extremities when the other passengers came up and interfered for the relief of the fallen philosopher. The old sailor was easily prevailed upon to desist, and our soiled dandy resumed his seat in the coach with little desire to renew his investigations into human nature. Now, Samuel Clemens apparently did not have any direct contact with Matthew, but he did read the carpet bag. Um, so we know, he, we know he was influenced because Matthew contributed as many as eight pieces to the carpet bag per weekly edition. Let's see here. Um, April 2nd, 1831, The Apprentice and the Ghost. Now we have a ghost story. Matthew did like ghost stories, especially when he was younger. Once he married Abby, she was a serious occultist, and uh, he uh, changed his... Um, skeptical attitude gradually in uh, connection with her. The Apprentice and the Ghost. Some years ago, there lived in Greenwich Street in this city, a tailor who had two apprentices. Like other young men in similar situations, they were accustomed frequently to pass their evenings about town and to indulge in habits as detrimental to their own health and pockets as to the business of their employer. Their master, from time to time, remonstrated with them on the course they were pursuing, and finally prevailed upon the one to abstain from late hours. With the other, however, his words had no effect. Jim, for that was the name by which the latter was called, still persisting in his own ways, his brother apprentice resolved upon an experiment to work a reform. With this view, he obtained a pair of breeches and stuffed them with bran, till they were as tight as the hide of an hippopotamus and having affixed them to a coat, hat, and shoes, he suspended the figure one evening when Jim was out at the head of the first flight of stairs in the hall, and then posted himself in a corner where he could witness the result of his experiment on the mind of his companion, and so on. He plays a, a trick on him. So uh, 
if I had dipped into the unsigned pieces in the constellation, there would have been a great deal more. Matthew wrote those as well, but uh, it's a little easier to make the case for the D. I think that D stood for either devil as in a printer's devil, because apparently he did a stint as a printer's devil for a little while in Boston, or it could stand for Diogenes, because Matthew identified with Diogenes. Abby had been teaching him about the Greek philosophers because she was his tutor during this period, probably mostly by correspondence, but when he would visit home in person. Um, and uh, so he identified with Diogenes and did publish two or three things under that name. So I'm guessing that D also stood for Diogenes. So, uh, you know, I don't know what the techniques are that the scholars use to compare writing style. They have the formulas that they apply to those things. And I think that if any of them took the time to decipher the earlier version of A Christmas Carol, which emerges from underneath the corkscrew redaction, if they first of all, you know, resurrected that, as I did with the first couple paragraphs, and then they analyzed that with Matthew's writing prior to 1843, they would find quite a number of similarities. They would also find Matthew's pet phrases. For example, in Ethan Spike, which is Matthew's one historically known character, he's quite fond of having this patriotic ignoramus say things like, uh, here's for the country right or wrong. And a similar phrase actually shows up in A Christmas Carol. My unhallowed hands shall not disturb it or the country's done for. This is typical Methusian language. And so are the jokes and the puns in A Christmas Carol. So, it's, again, it's very difficult to come to any absolute concrete conclusion with that kind of analysis. What I can say is that it's entirely plausible that Matthew could have been one of the real co-authors of A Christmas Carol based on style. That's about as far as you can take it. You can, you know, you can also say that it's somewhat more plausible, if you look at the way it was originally written, it's more plausible that Matthew was the author than that Charles Dickens was <laughs> by style. You know, uh, that's about as far as you can go. Uh, what are we at? 35 minutes. That's as much as I'm going to do here. I've got a lot to do today. I'm getting my COVID-19 first shot today, and I got to pick up some groceries in a little while, and this is going to take some editing. I don't, I don't think I'll put in too much of the originals in here. I mean, I can do that. It takes a lot more time to you know, create those. I might if I feel so inclined. And uh, we're going to get this put away. It's, there's no smoking gun in here, really, except maybe the country's done for. And, you know, there's, there's very unlikely to be any smoking guns looking at style like this. Again, all you can say is it's plausible. The detective work I've got, the clues I have are much stronger than this, you know. Um, as for anybody taking me seriously, I would say that not a single person on the planet believes me as I make this entry. You know, I don't know how many people have been exposed to my theory, but when I say really believes me, I mean a person that really believes me is going to get very excited about it and be very impressed by it and want to do something about it to either donate or to, uh, promote my work or something like that, you know. Um, and that hasn't happened at all. We've had people who are anywhere from disparaging to patronizing, you know, and that's as far as we go. That means that not a single person in the world has believed me, even though I have the evidence. You know? Well, when I published the paper on Edgar Allan Poe in about three months, that evidence is even stronger than what I have for A Christmas Carol. And I expect, I fully expect to get exactly the same reaction all the way from ridicule to people patting me on the head and saying, you know, that's, that's very nice and I'm kind of busy, but I'm glad and, you know, good luck with your work, you know. Um, every single one of those people assumes without questioning that assumption at all that I have to be mistaken. I have to be either self, they don't think I'm, 
I don't think people think I'm perpetrating a hoax because I just don't look the type, you know? I mean, do I look like a con artist to you? You know, they think I'm self-deluded. Every single person from the top to the bottom, from the most ignorant person up to the most intelligent and well-read, either in literary history or in parapsychology, they all think that I'm self-deluded and not a single one of them takes this seriously. And again, I know that because none of them can work up any real excitement about it, which they would have to if they believed it. <laughs> you know? So there we have it. Um, and I just keep on keeping on.